He's not making that up. It actually says professional music geek on my business card because my mother keeps asking me, what exactly is it that you do? And I have a very hard time telling her. Well, I do this radio show, and then I do some television, and I do some music writing, and then I do some consulting, and I do some public speaking, and I do this and that. She goes, yeah, but what is it that you do? So I just came up with this professional music geek thing as, as something that would kind of get my mom off my back. She still doesn't understand what I'm doing, but at least she can go and tell her friends at Bingo that her son is a, a professional music geek. A uh, couple of things before we start. First of all, there is a lot of parallels between, we were just talking about this earlier, between the tech business and the music business. The attitudes are very, very similar. If you're in tech, you're eating bad food, you're staying up late night, you are prone to being ripped off by somebody else, and you have no idea if you're going to be a success. Same thing as a musician. You're exactly in the same position. So as a result, I can see why Kitchener has the potential to be this music hub, because you've got the attitude already. The attitude of tech can be applied to the attitude of music, and you can't get anywhere without ambition. And tech is all about ambition, right? Starting up, it's all about ambition. Same thing. So these two things will go hand in hand. And this is why Austin, Texas does so well, because before they have South by Southwest every March, uh, they have a tech conference that comes before it. Of course, you know this, uh, the South by South Interactive Conference, or South by Southwest Interactive Conference. And this is because, this is, it's actually bigger than the music festival. And uh, companies go down there to introduce new products. I mean, their biggest get, I guess, over the last number of years has been Twitter. So I can't see why this city can't become exactly the same thing in the next little while. Now, we're going to talk about 10 rules regarding today's, 10 new rules regarding today's music business. It's going to be a bit harsh because there are some really hard truths here, but it's better that you have somebody tell you the truth rather than what somebody once told me. He said, oh no, encourage them, make them feel good. This isn't Tim Horton soccer. <laughs> this is a, music business is a cutthroat thing. There is, there are winners and there are losers. People keep score. So it is an art, but at the same time, it's a business. So let's just look at some of the things that we're talking about here. New rule number one, just because you make music doesn't mean you need to be heard. This is something that I get a lot from a lot of people. Says, Can't you just give my music a chance? No, I'm not going to give your music a chance because, well, I don't have to. If I think it has merit, if I think it's good, if I think you're a worthwhile artist with a future, yes. But if you're just some guy or some girl in a basement with a laptop, that doesn't give you the right to be heard. Um, the barriers to entry for being, in a mus uh, being a musician these days is really, really low. I mean, what do you need? You need garage band, you need a guitar, uh, maybe a, you know, a, a rudimentary mixer, and all of a sudden, you know, you're an indie artist. I was listening to Sirius XMU, which is the um, Sirius' uh, indie channel, and I was stunned by how all these songs are beginning to sound the same because none of these artists have the money to uh, buy or, or to rent time in a proper recording studio with a proper producer, so they do everything on their laptop in the basement. So it all sounds the same. Same drum sound, same keyboard sound, same vocal sound, same effects. It's, it's, it's starting to get a little mushy. Um, but it all comes down to the song. If you have a great song, everything else will take care of itself. How many people before last August, last September, heard of Psy? No one. And the guy had been around forever, but he managed to hit with one song. We don't, what's, what, what, what album did uh, Gangnam Style come from? <laughs> I don't know. Doesn't matter, because it's all about the song. Harsh statement number two. You're not going to make a lot of money selling music. You're just not. This, however, is not new. The only time in our history where musicians made a lot of money by selling physical product of their music began in about 1963, 1964, and it continued to roughly, you know, 2005 or so. Um, before then, all musicians made money in two ways. Number one, they were professional songwriters, and they were paid for their, for their work. Or number two, they played live. And that was it. The best you could have hoped to do was be a working musician. You wanted to have a career being able to make and perform music. Then, rock and roll hit, 
the music industry became formalized, and all of a sudden you had these value transactions where people were willing to pay a certain number of dollars for a piece of plastic. And a lot of people bought certain pieces of plastic a lot more than others, and as a result, you had a number of people getting rich. So Mick Jagger points out quite correctly that anybody who got into the music business between 1963 and 2005 was in a golden era of the music business because people were willing to pay you stuff for this piece of plastic. And you had organizations called labels that created these value propositions, these event, these retail events, where people would line up to hand over money for a piece of plastic. And we're not, that's not happening anymore because the traditional cultural gatekeepers have disappeared. And we'll talk about those in just a second. So you're not going to make a lot of money moving forward selling music. Where you may make money is licensing in terms of performance, in terms of maybe finding a career where you're doing something in addition to writing your own songs. But the idea of selling CDs or selling vinyl or even selling digital tracks or even having digital tracks stream on a service like Spotify or Audio, not so much. Now, right now, the audience has all the power. It used to be that, back in my day, you had radio stations, record labels, and a couple of magazines. That later moved to uh, video channels and maybe a few more radio stations. These were the filters. These were the cultural gatekeepers. They went through all the crap and only played the stuff that they thought would get them ratings or get them attention. So as a result, it was very tough to get through these filters. But then, June 1st, 1999, this guy named Sean Fanning goes on IRC, releases this thing called Napster to 30 people, and after that, everything changes because there was such unbelievable distrust and hatred of what the music industry had become. We were still paying 20 bucks for a CD when we were told that over time the price would come down. They had phased out the single, so if you wanted a song, you had to buy the $20 CD to get that song. So you got one track that you liked and 19 pieces of crap. Uh, and the record industry was hugely arrogant because they had this, um, one way of doing business and they couldn't they wanted to maintain control they wanted to be the cultural gatekeepers but when Napster came along and then Kazaa and Bearshare and iMesh and uh, Audio Galaxy and all the other ones that came Nutella uh, all of a sudden the record labels were here's your word disintermediated that meant we didn't need them anymore because we could go and gorge on this all-you-can-eat buffet of music and not only was it cheap, it was free. And suddenly, with the advent, uh, the advent of high-speed internet connections and faster modems and bigger hard drives, all of a sudden we could have way more music than we could ever afford. And the record industry wonders why they collapsed, because they fought against that, fought against that, fought against that. But right now, it is all over for them in their old business model, and now they're you know, 10, 12 years later, they're finally starting to see the error of their ways and embrace things. They understand that the audience, the individual, not a group of people, but the individual has the power to determine what they like, don't like, wish to discover, wish to ignore. It's a fantastic amount of power, and a lot of it is in one of these things. Um, or, see, this is the new Nokia. 920. Here's an iPhone 5. Um, okay, wait a second. I have a Z10 at home. I do have a Z10 at home. I, I, I forgot to bring it. I should have brought it. What was I thinking? Um, but all, you know, all, these, all these handheld devices uh, now have access to, to, to music. And again, we'll get to that. Now, here's an interesting thing to consider. The audience is extremely time-stressed. We gorged on the post-Napster buffet, like, wow, I mean, how many songs did some of us suck off the internet? A lot. But after a while, it became, wow, uh, okay, I like this song, but is it what everybody else is listening to? And, and there's gotta be something, if I like this, there's gotta be something better than this. Um, Oh, this is too much to deal with. Um, I, I'll bail after listening to 10 seconds of it. So as a result, we spent so much time researching and searching for music, we didn't spend any time savoring it. 
and we were always concerned about the next big thing. So our attention span for, that we were willing to devote to an individual song shrank, 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 shrank. And because the music was free or very close to it, it lost its value. The easier music became to access, the less we really cared about. I mean, if you had to hand over hard-earned dollars from a paper route to a guy at a record store for a $20 record or, or a piece of uh, or a CD, this thing was worth $20. I worked hard to get this $20 CD. But if I just download it off the internet, eh, whatever. Don't like it. I have 52,000 songs on, in my iTunes at home. 52,000. Do you know how many I listen to? About 150. That's about all. But I've got them, just in case. Do I value them as much as I should? I probably don't. So as a result now, the audience, severely time-stressed, they are now looking for help, which is why you're hearing all kinds of stories about curation. People curating things, people, uh, you know, blogs that create lists, algorithms that help and facilitate music discovery. Um, all those things are a big, big deal. You don't have to tell me if you're in the tech business, that is where things are going. Now, there is human-powered curation, too, with uh, things like Pandora and, and Slacker Radio. Um, there are music blogs, of course, that, you know, I, for example, write one. And uh, I hope that people trust my judgment and trust my taste, and hopefully they'll come back and, and to me for more recommendation. Uh, and as a result, I listen to all the crap so you don't have to. And believe me, see rule number one, I get lots of crap. Like, I get 100 emails a day for people saying, can you listen to my record? Okay, ooh, bad, next. You know, there's a lot of that. So uh, the audience is in charge, but they're beginning to understand that they're not really all that excited about it anymore. Now, this is directed at musicians. And we're going to do a, I'm going to introduce you to a bit of a survey later, later on that will really bring this to light. But as a musician, you need to be everywhere all at once. You have to become a geek. Sorry, you got to become one. You got to know how to build a website and how to maintain it. You got to you understand how to use a YouTube channel. You got to understand how to use Twitter. You have to understand how to use uh, Facebook. If you're a certain type of artist, you should be on Pinterest. Uh, it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's, there could be a kid out there that still wants to find you on MySpace. Well, guess what? You got to be on MySpace. Audience has all the power. They expect you to be everywhere. My wife is writing some books right now, and uh, I said, sweetie, if you're going to do this, I mean, you're going to have to have a Facebook page. But I hate Facebook. I, said, I know I hate Facebook too, but people expect you as a public figure or as an author, as an artist, to have a Facebook page. But I don't want to have a Facebook page. Too bad. It's a time suck. Yes, it is. But everybody expects you to have a Facebook page, have a Twitter account, have a YouTube channel. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're in, into if new music, you know, are you on SoundCloud? You better be. Are you uh, on, on Mixcloud? Well, you might have to be. So these are the things that you're going to have to, th this is what's going to suck up your time, is this, these, these efforts to be everywhere all at once. Um, and that includes selling digital tracks on iTunes. You know, it costs nothing. But if I want, if I hear about you and I actually do want to purchase your music, well, you'd better be on iTunes or you'd better be on HMV's The Vault or you'd better be on any number of these other online services that sell music. And you better be streaming on RDO. You better be streaming on, you know, anything, you know, insert name of streaming system here uh, because I'm going to expect that because that just happens to be my preference. Okay, here's where we talk about mobile. I had this amazing experience a number of years ago. I was in the Caribbean, and we go to this one island every year. And there is this hill that goes from sea level to about 200 meters above sea level. And I love to run it. And I live for 51 weeks of the year so I can go on this jog up this hill in the morning. And of course, I bring along my music. So I got to the base of the hill this one year. And I went for my running playlist, and the song that I always, always, always use to run up that hill was missing from the playlist. Oh, God. That was, oh, I was just heartbroken. But then I noticed that my phone was telling me that there was a Wi-Fi signal nearby. And there was. And it was unlocked. iTunes, found the song, 30 seconds, play, running up that hill. 
And that was a gigantic consumer experience for me. Something else happened to me, I guess it was last year, I'm at a Starbucks, it was uh, 10 after 7 on a Sunday morning, sitting there with the dog, I'm going through my email, and I run across uh, somebody raving about this band from LA that I had never ever heard of. And I thought, okay, well I'll have to remember to ask for that record the next time I go to the record. Wait, what? why would I do that? So I fired up RDO, search, found it, download, listen, 20 seconds. Again, a huge wake-up call for me. I mean, if you're younger than me, you're not going to have these same sort of revelations, but I'm the kind of guy that used to stand in line at midnight at a record store waiting for the store to open so I could buy, be the first of my block to have the record. So these things were absolutely huge. And, and the mobile nature of music, it's just getting more and more mobile. Um, iTunes is going to have our, um, well, they're calling it iRadio, some kind of streaming music service because they understand that Access is more important than possession to upcoming generations. Why should I actually physically own whether it, uh, a piece of music, whether it's an album, a 45, a CD, or even a digital file, when I can just get it whenever I want, I can just listen to it whenever I want. I pay five bucks or I pay 10 bucks a month or whatever it is, I have access to all the music that I would never buy with me all the time, even when I'm on an airplane. So um, every single handset manufacturer, every single online provider is trying to get into the music space. BlackBerry has theirs. Nokia has something that they're going to announce on, on Wednesday, which they're finally bringing to Canada. Uh, Google is talking about, at their I.O. conference, they're talking, there's, there's a rumor that they're going to release their streaming music service. Um, Apple is bogged down in iRadio, but uh, Warner and Universal are on board. They're just waiting for Sony to stop being such jerks and get on board. Um, and then, of course, we have apps from everything from Sirius XM to uh, RDO to you know, radio stations that have their own streaming apps. I mean, it's, and then wait till you see what's coming in cars. I was just at the Worldwide Radio Summit in Los Angeles, and we were spending an awful lot of time talking about the kinds of things that are coming in the dashboard. And the idea of the AM, FM, CD player is going to seem as primitive as an 8-track player very, very soon. If you're going to go buy a car in the next two years, one of the things that's going to influence your decision as to which car to buy is what's in the dashboard. And if you think I'm crazy, go test drive a Ford with a sync system. Go test drive a Cadillac with their um, in-tune system. Um, Honda, Volkswagen, um, Audi, that's Volkswagen, um, who else, Toyota. There's a whole bunch of, um, uh, there's, there's, there's a Mercedes-Benz, BMW, BMW's got, the BMW iPod, iPhone interface, the new one, is awesome. It's absolutely incredible because it basically replicates what you have on your phone screen on the dashboard. And that's what you want. And it's everything from, from music to navigation. It's fantastic. So music is becoming more and more mobile and people are accessing it away from wherever they are. Um, because they can. Rethink making albums. Again, what was the name of the album that Psy released? No one cares. About 25 years ago, Todd Rundgren came up with the idea of releasing songs online once a month, once every six weeks. People thought he was crazy. People are always going to want to buy albums. But Rundgren said, no, this is going to be the way of the future. Bands are going to have to drip music to their fans. And they're not going to want to wait between, you know, two, three, four years between albums. Why not just give them something every month, keep them you know, close to the, your vest, and, and keep them entertained, rather than force them to go long periods of time without new material from them. So we're starting to see artists who are willing to do just this. Every four weeks, every six weeks, every eight weeks, whatever it is, they have a new song and they make a big deal. The problem is that the music industry is still tied to the notion of the album. And again, this is a retail opportunity, it is a retail event for the label. It's also a big deal when it comes to things like awards. You know, you, you know if you're gonna compete for a Juno, you have to have an album to be entered as a, in the Junos. Or uh, if you're looking for a factor grant, maybe you need to actually fill out a form that says that you want money to create an album. So. We're, we're going to have albums with us for, for a while yet. However, 
you might want to stop thinking about flooding your fan base with lots of songs when they only really want one or two at a time. Instead of filling up an album with 15 pieces of crap, which is something a lot of us still remember, you might want to spend a little extra time working on those other 13 songs, or 15 songs, uh, and making them better. It's not happening just yet, but rethink the idea of making albums. There's not one, everybody talks about the new model of business. Well, there isn't one new model, there are many new models. And some work better than others, some work better in other situations than others. But the trick is, as music entrepreneurs, which is what everybody in this audience should be if you're a musician, uh, you're going to have to find new, new steady, normal, uh, steady, lucrative ways of bringing in money while still being free to create and perform. There are a number of institutions around Southern Ontario that are jumping on this bandwagon, and they're actually teaching music entrepreneurship courses. Uh, Coalition Entertainment, which runs the careers of Finger Eleven and Simple Plan and Our Lady Peace and a whole bunch of others, uh, have a headquarters at Victoria Park and Lawrence in uh, Toronto, and they have this intense seven-week music entrepreneurship program. And it basically tells you how to run your band as a business, because 50% of the music business is business. So if you don't know how to put together a band agreement, if you don't have a band bank account and how to handle that, if you don't have like a, not necessarily articles of incorporation, but something equivalent to that, spelling out you know, the rules and responsibilities of all the band members and the people associated with the band, if you don't know how to uh, fire somebody from a band, to shield yourself from all kinds of uh, legal liabilities, you know, you need to take one of these courses. I think they're, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. Metalworks does the same thing. I think uh, Harris Institute does the same thing. It's worth it. They can be expensive, but uh, it's not as expensive as being sued by an ex-band member over songwriting royalties after you've had a platinum record. Uh, and they will, a lot of these, or, uh, these, these um, a lot of these places will also talk about all the different, um, new models that are out there. Next one. You need to be in it for the long haul. Uh, the idea of hitting it big immediately has never really been realistic, but it's even more, even less realistic now. Uh, you know, there is a Justin Bieber, okay? But, I mean, I come back to Cy. Guy's 32 years old or 33 years old, whatever it is. The chubby little guy has been working on records for uh, 10 or 12 years, and he finally hit it big. So you have to be in this for the long haul. You have to be willing to accept the zigs and zags that come along with your career. It's not necessarily, it probably won't hit right away. You're going to have to find your niche. When um, I was a uh, program director at a radio station, I would spend a lot of time talking to people, young announcers, about their performance and who they wanted to be on the radio. And I said, you, won't, you have no idea who you are on the radio for five years. You need five years of real world work on air before you begin to even form the on air personality that you're going to be for the rest of your career. And it's the same thing with a musician. You know, you're going to start out doing something, but you'll evolve. You'll get better, you'll get smarter, you'll find out what works and what doesn't. So you've got to be in it for the long haul. And now I'm going to shoot myself in the foot. There are exceptions to all these rules. There are people who manage to do it the old-fashioned way. There are people who manage to become big overnight. There are people who manage to make a lot of money from selling records. But they are more and more and more in the minority. So. As long as there is an album, uh, sorry, as long as there is a, a studio system, a label system that is perpetuating the album and old style forms of marketing and promotion, you're going to have these odd successes. But if you look at album sales today, the number of gold and platinum albums compared to the number of gold and platinum albums 10 years ago, the decrease is. I think it's like there's 70% fewer. It's small. And well, back in 1998, if you were a superstar act, you could expect to sell 15 million records, 20 million records, 25 million records. Today, if you're a superstar act, you sell six or five or four. But there's, I haven't, I can't remember the last time somebody mentioned a diamond album in the US. A diamond album is somebody that sells 10 million records. 
uh, but I can't remember a contemporary artist that has been awarded a diamond award for years. I mean, Led Zeppelin gets one for Led Zeppelin IV, and you know, just all these, these legacy acts that have finally sold 10 million records, but I can't think of a new artist that has. Justin Bieber hasn't. Um, Celine Dion has one. Um, Shania Twain has one. Alanis Morissette has one. These are, those are the three Canadians that have diamond awards. And that's about it. And what was interesting, too, is that the Canadian, um, the Canadian certification levels for albums has dropped quietly. It used to be 100,000 for, uh, for a platinum album and 50,000 for a, a gold. Well, they dropped that to 80,000 and 40,000 because nobody was selling any records, so they couldn't give any award certifications. And just this past week, uh, Billboard, or the, no, it's the um, uh, Recording Industry Association of America announced that they are now going to take into account song streams on streaming music services into account when they're assembling statistics for awarding gold and platinum albums in the United States. That is a huge deal because it says that, well, we're not selling records anymore, we're not selling digital tracks anymore, so we have to find some way of awarding these people something for their achievements, so we're just going to count streams, which is the equivalent of awarding a gold record or a platinum record for the number of times your song is played on the radio. But that's the way things are going right now. So uh, those are my 10 rules. Um, if you have any questions, let's, let me answer a, answer a few questions if you have any, and then we're going to do a survey, or I'm going to introduce you to a survey. Okay? And this survey, I think, is really important. I'll explain it in a set. Does anybody have any questions about anything before? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, the two questions here. Uh, Chris Anderson's The Long Tail. Everybody familiar with that book? Okay. Oh, okay, and the second one is, is the level of instrumentation, the level of virtuosity dropping in terms of today's music? Okay, first one, um, Chris Anderson's Long Tail Theory is being, is under attack from people who say that, uh, yes, a lot of songs are available for purchase or streaming, whatever, but uh, that has helped the consumer, the niche consumer, and it really hasn't helped the performer or the composer at all because they're just not getting any money from it. So uh, while it's true that if you're just a, if a, a consumer of music, it's awesome, but as a composer or, or uh, performer, not so much. Um, as for uh, level of virtuosity, you know, this is a complaint that I've heard from every generation who believe that Oh, you kids today, you just suck. Your music is horrible. But here's something to remember. Every generation has a biological right to believe the music of their youth is the greatest music ever made. <laughs> that music is the music that you enjoy between the ages of 15 and 25. From when you go into high school and just before you get your car to the time that you graduate from university or college and have to get a real life and a real job. Because during those 10 years, that is an important psychological time when you use music as a way of projecting your identity to the world. You become a goth, you become a punk, you become a hair metal kid, you know, and whatever music you listen to is, is, is this is who I am, this is what I do. And you have all kinds of extra time and all kinds of disposable income to spend on music. But then you get out of university and you get married, you got a mortgage, you got kids, you got a car, you got a job. Eh, it's just a little bit too much trouble. So you drift away from discovering, most people drift away from discovering music, and uh, what you end up doing is just buying reissues of the music that you bought between 15 and 25. It's the way, it's the cycle of life. It's the way it works. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll go here first. Uh, 
Oh, okay, again, I've heard this one before. When is the guitar going to finally go away? Well, 1980, we thought it was dead with when Technopop rose. And there was a whole period of time, 80, 81, 82, 83, where we thought oh, the future was synthesizers, future was keyboards, guitar rock is dead. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, then there was a time in the late 90s when everybody was buying turntables. And for a few brief moments, at least in the UK, turntables outsold guitars. People were saying, that's it, it's rap, it's hip-hop, it's turntablism. Guitar rock is dead. And now we're seeing people get into doing a lot of stuff on their laptops um, because it's cheap and because it's convenient. And people are saying, ah, oh, you know, guitar rock is dead. So, uh, yeah, guitar rock is like the, those pretty vampires on True Blood. You can't kill them. Yeah, you know, have you, have you watched a kid listen to music? They're perfectly happy with the tinny crap that's coming out of their laptop speakers. Quality, high fidelity, is not an issue. Convenience outweighs everything. And th that makes me sad. It, it really does, because I'm, when I was growing up, I mean, we saved all our money to get the biggest speakers possible from Radio Shack. You know, we would, uh, we would uh, you know, the guy with the biggest, uh, you know, most powerful car stereo was, was God. But now, that's not the case. People, you know, they, they listen to compressed MP3s on crappy little earbuds that they bought from Skullcandy for $22.95. And they're perfectly fine with that. Now, you do have people that, you know, buy Beats headphones for $399 and listen to over bassy music that's completely distorted and doesn't have anything to do with how that music actually sounds. But they think that's high fidelity. So the concept of beauty in music has changed with the generations. There is a professor at Stanford University who does a survey every year with the incoming freshmen. And he plays them a proper high fidelity piece of music with all its dynamic range and frequency response. And then he plays them an MP3 of the same piece of music. Which one, he says, sounds more beautiful? And over the last number of years, it has gone from the high fidelity recording to the MP3 recording. The students actually believe that sound, that fidelity, is more beautiful than a faithful recording. So, and I, I, you know, I love people who are buying vinyl. I love people like Neil Young who have got his Pono system. I love this idea of, of people who are mad, mad at Apple for not having uh, uh, iTunes able to support Flack, um, all that stuff. And I'm hoping that there is going to be some sort of renaissance when it comes to the appreciation of properly recorded high fidelity music. I have a 14 year old nephew and I want to punch him in the throat <laughs> because you know he's happy with crappy sound. So he's coming out from Winnipeg next week. I'm going to sit him down in my studio at home, which has way more power than a household studio should have. And I'm going to put on my 20th anniversary 180 gram reissue of the first Rage Against the Machine album. And he is going to sit there and he's going to enjoy it and he's going to understand it. Okay. Yes. So, follow up to that, uh, did you comment then on the increased uh, sales of vinyl? It, okay, the vinyl, okay, it's a bit overdone. It's a good story, but in terms of percentages of sales devoted to vinyl, it's still really, really tiny. I mean, we're still, in all of the United States, I think three million pieces of vinyl were sold last year. Just three million. In the UK, on Record Store Day, which had all that kind of hype, they sold 80,000 pieces of vinyl. All artists, all labels. 
on that one day. So the, the actual numbers are small. But what is encouraging is that you're realizing that there are people out there who still like the physical product, the tactile sensation of having something in their hand as they're listening to it, rather than distractedly listening to something as they're walking through the mall with headphones on. Um, and here's a psychological perspective on it. People are into vinyl because it's so damned inconvenient. You need special equipment. It needs special attention to listen to it and to operate it, and it's not portable. So by being into vinyl, you're projecting part of your personality. See how much I love music? I love music so much that I'm willing to go through all these inconveniences to consume it. That makes me better. <laughs> and I understand that. I, I, I feel exactly the same way. I listen to vinyl still at home because, well, I have a lot of MP3s, I have a lot of CDs, but when I can, I, would like, I just like to listen to vinyl because it demands my attention and focus. And that's pretty Luddite in today's society, but I still, I still enjoy it. Can we do uh, our, our survey here? I want to show you, this, I think this is really important. Oh, by the way, that's uh, my website. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I've stalled. Okay, so here's the website. You might want to write this down. I'm going to show you a preview of it. We're not going to do the survey here uh, because it is, uh, it's, it's very intensive. But if you, yeah, you can just go there. This is going to be official release uh, next week, I think. There you go. Has everybody got that? Okay. Okay, here we go. Now, this is really tough to see, but what it is, it's a generic, it's, it's a social networking and digital media survey. And it's been put together by um, a promotion company called Dale Speaking, and what it does is it seeks to get an idea of where musicians are at when it comes to digital media and social networking. So it asks a whole bunch of questions about, you know, your band, what kind of music you play, um, you know, that sort of stuff. But then it gets a little deeper, and it talks about, you know, if your band created an album, how many albums have you made within the last 12 months? How many have you sold? If your band plays shows, what's the average attendance? You know, what kind of followers do you, does your band have on Twitter? Do you have a Facebook page? How many subscribers do you have to your mailing list? What do you mean you don't have a mailing list? Do you have a domain name? I mean, 15 bucks, go to hover.com and get yourself a domain name. There's nothing more, you know, Gene Simmons taught me this. Um, he says, the worst thing that a band can have is a website domain that begins www.wordpress.nameofband <laughs> or www.blogger.nameofband. No, spend 15 bucks with hover.com, get yourself a personalized domain, Redirect everything to that. It looks way more professional, and you have some proper emailing, email addresses as well. So here's a little bit more. Talk about your band's achievements. You know, um, has your band ever toured outside of Canada? How many subscribers does your band have uh, to uh, its YouTube channel? Um, how many followers, how many likes do you have on, on Facebook? And then it goes even further here, and it talks about you know, how you spend, how do you market your band? How often do you send out email blasts to your fan base? Um, you know, how often do you sign up for other musicians or artists mailing lists? You know, what kind of social network marketing and networking are you doing? If you have a website, who designed it? Was it a friend or did you have something done per professionally? You know, what kind of CMS do you have behind your, your, uh, your website? And what do you do with it? So um, this will make it a little bit easier. There's the big QR code. So if you want to take a picture of that, that'll take you to where you want to go as well as the uh, as well as the URL I gave you I hope that works couldn't make it any bigger okay. everybody got their pictures okay wait All right, 
And just in case, again, this is the Dale Speaking New Media Survey for Musicians. Here's the URL one more time. Um, I have very little to do with this survey other than I asked for a, they asked me to, to put in a couple of uh, suggestions for it. But you're going to hear from Rue later on today and, and uh, talk more about it. But this will help everybody get a, uh, an idea of where things are in terms of Canadian musicians and uh, their attitudes towards the digital space and social networking marketing. And there'll be a big um, release for it next week. So, yeah, I mean, nobody's seen this yet. This is brand new. So um, please fill it in. The more data, the more uh, appropriate the, uh, the responses. So thank you for your time. I appreciate your attention. I hope you got something out of this.